I know both your emails, but uh, Val, I don't know that I've got yours, but if, if you would put your email, your name and your parish down, just Maria's gonna send you all of this stuff that we present tonight. Right. So, uh, you know, um, this is the smallest of the events, but hopefully next year we'll have more people and we'll figure out a way to network Catholics and the legal professions together. And as you know, Terry, usually we have really quite a nice turnout for that mass and that reception do, yeah. at the cathedral. Um, why don't you go ahead and start rolling on the screen share? And thanks, uh, thanks Val, for pop popping in your email address. So again, everything you see tonight, we're going to be sending you out. Just a little reminder: I'm pushing this out as well as the weekly mailing. This is. Um, you know, a professional day that's coming up this Saturday. It's another opportunity. We're really aware that um, opiate overdoses have doubled, death due to opiate overdoses have doubled during this COVID-19 year. So um, we've had good participation with Dr. Fernando Ortiz already around the Feast of Guadalupe. I had him talking about um, opiate addiction in general. We did something on President's Day around uh, pornography and kind of the process addictions that go on. We're having him back this Saturday and we're really trying to encourage parishes, whether youth ministers, youth volunteers, anybody related to outreach to jump in. He'll be talking from nine to 11 in English and 11 to one in Spanish. It's really how do we better serve youth with the challenges of addictive behaviors? What's going on with the adults? How do we help parents? And I'm just aware that the parish is often the first link uh, for these kinds of issues, as is Dr. Fernando Ortiz. Dr. Ortiz is Director of Counseling Services at Gonzaga University. He's also opening a therapy center. Um, he does all the screening of all of our seminarians in Washington State for all three dioceses. He also screens all the deacon and permanent deacon candidates. So it will be, a, you know, just want to let you know about that. I don't know that we've got, do we have anything else besides this, Maria, to share? I think, ah, uh, yeah. Well, these are the training opportunities. I think we can skip through this because I don't think these gentlemen are doing confirmation training. Um, but why don't we go to the screen share on uh, Maria for the actual presentation. Uh, as, uh, um, first of all, I'm just grateful to have anybody here given COVID um, and if you go ahead and click on uh, slideshow, Maria, there you go, and go from beginning, go over to from beginning, no, from beginning up, there we go, click. So, um, and then you can close the left window if you want, um, maybe not. Well, anyway, you know, as you all, as you know, and Terry, you've just been a real hero on this. Every year, I do three uh, professional masses um, at the cathedral with reception and whatnot. And, you know, um, we, we always do a red mass, which is traditional. Many bishops do the red mass, pulling together legal professionals. Uh, we also do a, a white mass for medical professionals. And then I intervened in, 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 you know, kind of invented the blue mass for first responders, if you think the little light on the police car. Uh, so go ahead and, and next, uh, next one. So that's the context for tonight. And let me just open with this prayer and I'll be sending this out to you. This is composed by St. Thomas More, uh, who is one of the patron saints of lawyers. So we'll begin with this. And this is something he composed. So let us pray. Lord, grant that I may be able in argument, accurate in analysis, strict in study, candid with clients, and honest with adversaries. Sit with me at my desk and listen with me to my clients' plaints. Read with me in the library, stand beside me in court, so that today I shall not, in order to win a point, lose my soul. Through Christ our Lord, amen. I, I thought that was a lovely, uh, oh, Deacon Alfredo is coming in from uh, Kennewick. 
I thought that was a lovely prayer. <laughs> we'll be sending this out to you, and maybe I can actually get it on a Stampia or a Holy Card for you. So again, thank you for being here, and uh, uh, go ahead, Maria. Uh, uh, yeah. So let me just note this, that in the medieval world, and Terry's heard this before in one of the homilies, the medieval world, there were really three professions, clergy, law, and uh, medicine. And each, it, they were called profess, professions because professu in Latin is a required an oath, an oath to uphold the law, an oath to do no harm, the Hippocratic oath, and of course the uh, promises clergy make. Um, and so that's what I've tried to do is kind of build um, you know, we're going to probably do it different even in the future, but I, I'm trying to find ways to network together Catholics who are in the legal profession in any way. So that's, that's the uh, kind of background to this. So go ahead and we'll do the next one. Um, and of course, that's the networking I want to do. Go ahead, Maria. Uh, you know, what I just want to do is just give you a little fervorino, a little, you know, spiritual chiclet this particular land. Normally I've got a homily. But as you know, we talk about prayer, fasting, and almsgiving or mercy being the three disciplines of Lent. And I've given you a little bit of the way uh, Peter Chrysologus talks about this, um, that, uh, we, you know, if you pray, fast, if you fast, show mercy. When you fast, see the fasting of others. If you want God to know that you're hungry, know that another is hungry. What Peter Chrysostom is really getting at here is these three traditional Lenten disciplines that we do every year. They're interrelated. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. We fast so others feast through our alms. We, uh, we pray uh, in order that we fast and show mercy. Now, what Father Robert Barron, or Bishop Robert Barron has done, uh, is basically, click, go ahead, uh, Maria. Uh, yeah. So what I'm just uplifting for you is the three uh, pathways to holiness that somewhat relate to prayer, fasting, almsgiving. Prayer really is find your center in Christ. That's the third, first path, pathway to holiness. Second pathway is know you're a sinner. And third pathway, your life is not about you. You know, when I first became Bishop of Yakima, uh, Bishop uh, Cardinal George at that point called me on the phone after I was named Bishop of Yakima. And um, it was quite the conversation. I pulled over and the Cardinal kind of started talking about how he loved Yakima. Um, and, uh, you know, he went on with stories for about 20 minutes. And I, I said... Uh, Gosh, Cardinal, it's very kind of you to call me. He said, well, I got some more stories. You've got more time. And off he went with more stories. Uh, I think because I was from Yakima, he put me on the seminary board at Mundelein. It's also now where many of our men study. And Robert Barron at that point was on the faculty. And um, he was really um, the second rector I worked with there. Then he became auxiliary bishop in Los Angeles. He actually organized the whole formation program at Mundelein around these three pathways. Find your center in Christ. Know that you're a sinner. Your life is not about you. Go ahead, Maria. Next one. So when we talk about finding our center in Christ, Lent helps us put things first, which is God. And, you know, God is not one more among many uh, beings uh, populating the world, really, we understand God is the ground of all being. Everything we have, everything we do, everything we are, everything, this is all of God. Really points me to the next PowerPoint, Maria, in terms of the famous monk, Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton, you know, a little background about him, you know, um, at the point, this is about, you know, the first pathway, uh, 
find your center in Christ. It's about prayer. You know, Merton went visiting in Europe with his good buddy, Robert Lax. And it was in that context, they toured Europe, they toured the great cathedrals. Both were writers at the time. Um, Merton was unattached, he wasn't married, and he wasn't even Catholic. And of course, a lot of us know of Thomas Merton, Father Thomas Merton is kind of this giant of uh, American spirituality, really introducing the wider North American culture to Catholicism. But at the time he wasn't Catholic, Robert Lax kind of sponsored him and he got baptized. And so then Robert says, now, Tom, now that you're Catholic, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I don't know. I'm, when we get back, I'm going to get a job. I, hopefully I'll find a wife, settle down, have a family, you know, and, you know, cook in with a parish. Robert Lax says, no, Tom, that's not enough. You're called to be a saint. We're all called to be a saint. This is his pathway to holiness, finding our center in Christ. Well, Tom Merton kind of mold that around, and he writes in um, one of his books, um, he, he writes about as this profound spiritual experience. I uplift it for you because it's in the context of daily life. He writes in Louisville, he's standing in Louisville on the corner of 4th and Walnut, and suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that he loved all these people, that they were mine, I was theirs, we cannot be alien, even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation in a special world. And then going on from there, you know, he goes on to note that it was as if suddenly he saw the secret beauty in the depths of their hearts. This was kind of a profound experience, but this profound spirituality of Thomas Merton happened in, Lu in downtown Louisville, D D Kentucky. And as, as, as fate would have it, he had stirrings to become a priest and a monk, and he ended up joining Gethsemane Abbey, which is in Kentucky, not far from Louisville, and ended up being novice director and really ended up really endowing the church with a great heritage and really giving a doorway to regular U.S. folks, an understanding of Catholicism based on his writings. Uh, but it all, you know, finding our center in Christ. It, it, you know, it leads me to the next point. And Archbishop Hunhausen, you know, we talk about, go ahead, Maria. Archbishop Hunhausen would talk about, you know, when we're getting a prayer life, knowing a time, having a time, having a place, and having a method. In other words, when we're finding our center in Christ, there needs to be a time and a place and method to what we're doing. You know, like in the morning, in my chair, I will pray the rosary. That's time, place, method. Or in the evening, uh, before I go to sleep, in my chair, in the living room, I'm going to read the readings of the upcoming Sunday. Time, place, method. Really not super complicated. Huh? But prayer, and this gets me to my next point, Maria, you know, is allowing ourselves to be found by God. When we have a time and a place and a method, this isn't so much about us poking at God saying, you hoo it's really the other way around. It's allowing ourselves to be found by God, wasting time with God. Now, I've got this picture here. This is of, of the monks at, Saint, at Mount Angel, one of the other uh, places where we send our seminarians. And when you go to Mount Angel, of course, they're praying the Psalms, uh, you know, the office, uh, louds, known, sext, evening prayer, compline. Same prayers over and over again. But in a certain sense, we allow ourselves to be found by God in the routine of prayer. In fact, you know, what really begins to happen is we don't read the Psalms. The Psalms read us. There'll be words and phrases that snag on us today that didn't when we were 20 years younger as a young monk, so to speak. And new prayer phrases, even of prayers, were snag at us. See, it's time of prayer, allowing ourselves to be found by God. It's a structured way in which we begin to notice 
how the scriptures work on us interiorly, how the prayers of the church work on us. So that prayer. Prayer, you know, and this gets me to my next point. You know, what in Lent, we are really praying to receive the light of Christ, to ground ourselves in Christ who is light. Now, as you know, Lent leads to Easter. Easter is the great feast of the liturgical year, um, where at the Easter Vigil, the, the newly baptized receive the light of Christ. At the Easter Vigil, the doors we say, Christ our light. And it really sends us back to Christmas, where Christ is the light of the world. Obviously, in our culture, Christmas feels like the big feast. But really, the liturgical year, our life of prayer is Christmas to Easter and back again, Easter being the big feast. So this is all about, you know, finding our center in Christ, who is light. So again, three pathways to holiness. Uh, know that we are, find our center in Christ. That's prayer. Fasting, know that we are sinners. And the third pathway, your life's not about you. This kind of leads me to talk about know that you are sinners. And I've got a little bit of a windshield wiper here because this is kind of a homey image. The reality is when we fix our center in Christ who is light, we automatically discover our sin. It's like driving winter in central Washington. Uh, I do a certain amount of winter night driving, particularly up in Ellensburg, actually, um, because the campus ministry mass is always at 7 p.m. And during COVID, um, you know, uh, Father Chicone is the pastor at St. Andrews in Ellensburg. He does a lot of teaching now via Zoom with Magnificat. So I told him, uh, we can't be on the campus, so we're doing the campus mass at the parish. So if I have the seven, I'll take your five and you can get away. So I do five and seven, which puts me back on the road at night. One of the things that happens is at night, you know, they've got the rock salt and, you know, the, you know, the uh, little de-icing compound. At night, all this stuff, you know, slings onto your windshield, but you really don't know it. But what happens, of course, the next day, and I think we've all had the experience, after I've had a night drive and I go out and it's a bright sunny day in central Washington, and I turn my car into the sun, suddenly I can't see through the windshield because all the night grime from I-82 and Manastash built up on the windshield the night before. I didn't notice it because it's night driving. But I can't see because the light is exposing the road grind. Well, that's the relationship between that first pathway and second pathway to holiness. When our life is centered in Christ and we turn our direction into Christ, suddenly the light of Christ shows the road grime of our soul. Huh? So know that we are a sinner. You know, the light of Christ highlights our sin. Let me go to my next point here, Maria. Um, you know, let me just talk about a couple ways of when we're talking about sin. Matt Jensen's a theologian and written a number of books. Um, he notes that one of um, Augustine's main ways of talking about sin is this Latin phrase, incurvatus, in say. Huh? it being turned inward. Um, uh, homo incurvatus in se is a phrase also from Martin Luther that he picks up uh, from St. Augustine. Go ahead and my next point would be this. See, well, let, go back. I'm sorry, I'm not ready for this point. Uh, let, me, let me just say this. See, when we're struggling with sin, those parts of ourselves are kind of contorted and turned inward it, it's it, we're turned in um robert Barron, he, when he was rector at mundelein before he became auxiliary bishop he used to help out in a parish out in winnitka illinois he gave a talk and um you know and a famous golfer i don't remember the name came up to him and said that you know father that was a great talk 
if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. And Baron's like, yeah, there's something you can do. You can teach me to pray, to play golf. Play golf. Yeah. Teach me how to golf. And, you know, you know, I personally don't golf either. Life is frustrating enough without trying to sink a little ball into a hole. However, I've been to my share of golf tournaments, just being a priest and a bishop. Well, Baron goes out on the golf course for his golf lesson. And, you know, the instructor says, show me your swing. Well, he shows his string. No, what? no, no, your legs are wrong. No, no, show me. No, no, your arms are in the wrong position. Finally, he says, I want you uh, to imagine, uh, imagine that you're a waiter in a restaurant and you got a tray on, on your hand and there's glasses there and you're a waiter and you're reaching back to offer cold drinks to those behind you. So pretend you're holding a tray and this is how you'll know the position of your arms when you're swinging. Now go back, farther back, it hurts. Yeah, I know, farther, it really hurts. Yep, keep going, farther, there. That is where your arms are supposed to be when you swing the golf club. And of course, Baron says, I swang the go, and there went the ball. Went farther and f better than anything I'd ever seen. And then he said, almost as good, he said, oh, Lord, how I love your law. In other words, lawyers, the law is not an affront to freedom. It's the very means that frees us for excellence. That's how we understand church teachings. The church teachings aren't an affront to freedom. They're the very vehicle that frees us. See, you know, uh, and this is kind of, in, in order to get into the swing of life, we've got to become kind of uncontorted. This is where Augustine comes from in Corvatus Inse, in terms of um, sin, becoming, you know, less contorted, less curved inward, curved outward, learning to love others. That would, let me get my, my another one more definition of sin, you know, and again, um, find your center in Christ, know your, it, know your center, your life is not about you, three pathways to holiness. So, uh, go ahead, uh, Maria. Um, the other word for sin that I just want to uplift for you is this one, and it's St. Paul, it's hamartia. Now, in the Old Testament, there are a lot of words for sin. Sin as uh, lawyer fans, sin is law-breaking. That's one of the definitions. Sin is rebellion, very first cousin to law-breaking. Sin is turning away from God. Sin is refusal. Sin. We're, we're reading this rather flat in English. When we see the word sin, we're assuming that that's the same word through scripture. It's not. There is, there's a wide variety of words for sin in Greek. And much of our Old Testament translations, some of it's in Greek, some of it's in Hebrew. Wide variety. St. Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians, he picks up one word for sin consistently, and that is hamartia. And it's actually Corinth. If you remember in the Olympics movement, every year, you know, every time we have the Olympics, Greece is always the first in. The Greek, Greece, of course, is the birthplace of the Olympics, but what we often don't remember is the birthplace of the Olympics in Greece is actually Corinth. Uh, Corinth hosted the Isthmian Games, what we now know as the Olympics. So Paul is going to Corinthians, these kind of ESPN addicted uh, citizens before there was ESPN. They had great sports arenas. Uh, the Corinthians were just sports lovers. So Paul, looking at all of these possible words for sin, he picks up this one word, hamartia, meaning to miss the mark. And he's taking it directly from the Greek, uh, well, from the Olympic sport of archery. Um, 
so that you know the the moral life the life of moral excellence is about re-aiming and not becoming discouraged uh you know sin is missing the target um i mean the sports analogy to the spiritual life is it's not a bad one i like to make it quite a bit I mean, if you look at uh, we're in March Madness and uh, the Acme Herald had the little, you know, chart, you know, you know, who's going to be in the final four and all that. Um, NBA, you know, Stephen Curry, probably one of our better, or probably one of our better, you know, Golden State, great player. He gave an interview, um, I think it was at ESPN Magazine, or I can't remember where I read it. But he talked about how after practice, when all the guys have dispersed, he stays on the court or he stayed on the court as kind of a rookie player and positioned himself at different points in that court, practicing the swish, you know, the three pointers. And he would do it from a variety of positions and angles and to build muscle memory so that under the pressure of the game, he always knew where the basket was. Now, when I was telling high school kids this story, uh, I happen to know that we are gentlemen here. I don't know about Val, if you, you play basketball at all as a kid, but uh, I know Chris and, and Terry, and we are all kind of of a same age. Let's put that on the table. And basketball when I was in grade school and junior high it was a passing game I mean this three-point thing didn't even exist uh the game really shifted when we ended up with these three-point shots and it kind of trickled up into the NBA if you remember uh Michael Jordan you know he was kind of a and eh, you know he didn't he didn't make his high school basketball team when he first turned out. Um, then he, you know, played and played pretty well and got into college ball at a small scholarship. <clears throat> of course, the three point rule now is coming into its ascendancy. And he forced himself to make 500 shots a day, not shoot, but make. See, the moral life is about this excellence of learning to aim our life, our language, our actions towards love and learning how to do that ever more accurately and not becoming discouraged when we miss the mark. See, this is the moral life that St. Paul is um, uplifting. And I mean, I, you would know this better than I do. Um, I mean, I remember, Chris, you telling me that you were a soccer coach. In many ways, you know, uh, the moral life is, is, is not simply about right and wrong any more than probably for you as lawyers, as people involved in the legal profession, um, you know, in its best moments, uh, the professio of the law of being a lawyer is really about bringing forth justice and helping helping people recalibrate and reaim their lives. See, this know you know that we are sinner is about how we can get back on the field, how we can build the muscle memory morally, and learn how to aim our lives better. Um, you know, talking about our about ourselves as sinners is not about destroying our self esteem. It's about being grounded in Christ and wanting to aim our life towards Christ. That's the connection. Find your sinner in Christ, you know that you're a sinner. So here's my last point, and that's about uh, the last one, Maria, uh, here, is, um, is almsgiving. Your life is not about you. Now, it's interesting, we use the term almsgiving in English, and Spanish speakers see the words alma, you know, giving from your soul. Of course, Spanish speakers would say limosna for almsgiving. They don't use um, the um, Latin-based almsgiving. Um, but this is straight from Richard Rohr. I mean, uh, a lot of us, you know, Robert Barron is certainly 
lift up this phrase, but, but Richard Rohr says the entire spiritual life can be summarized. Your life is not about you, you know? Uh, certainly you know, with the confirmation youth and even with the seminarians, I'm trying to think God has a plan for you. You know, what makes your heart sing? Uh, what are you good at? And what are other people seeing you? I just put out those basic questions, particularly for young adults. But basically, how will I make an alm of my life? How will I give the stuff from my soul, el alma in Espanol, which means soul. Um, I gave you a little quote from the catechism. Uh, and the spiritual principle of human beings, the soul is the subject of human consciousness and freedom. Soul and body form one unique human nature. Each soul is individual and immortal, immediately created by God. The soul does not die with the body from which it is separated by death and which it will be united in the final resurrection. I mean, love is the direction of our life. Love is our goal. Love, you know, survives even death. Um, not to get too, you know, personal. Um, I think I'd mentioned this to a couple of you. I, we needed to put my mom into memory care about eight months ago, and it was really difficult. Um, and it was a slow process. And, you know, my dad was just really reluctant. We brought in, you know, a chore worker from Catholic Charities. And she's still actually working now with my dad just in the home. But my, my dad visits my mom every day, even with COVID, you know, through the window, through the phone, you know. And it, it's been a gift to, for me to see that kind of tenderness, that you know, it wasn't always evident just in their day-to-day -day life together with the rush of career and family, you know. Um, this is, you know, giving of your soul to another. Um, go ahead, Maria. So, um, and that, that, that what, what makes my heart sing? I mean, I think the question I would just offer for you at either now or for later is just, what feeds my passion for the law? And think about that in the context of being a good aim. Um, and I would want to also know any way I could support you, your friends in the legal profession. I think what I'm trying to do long term is find ways to help us network um, legal professionals together and, and feel like their faith is supporting the, their, their profession. I mean, Terry and I have talked about this. It's a little bit of a fast year this year, no mass, no reception. Um, but I sure thank you for considering these points. Go ahead, Maria. So um, Terry, I was just going to invite you to maybe, you're always good each year at announcement time about saying something. Uh, and then I just want to maybe open up for comments either on my more extended homily today or anything you want to raise. But uh, Terry, I uh, by the way, Terry, uh, all of these I found online when I clicked insert picture online pictures. These are all in the public domain. Oh, so, well, okay. Uh, they're not copyrighted, Terry. <laughs> no, they're not. And, uh, yeah. um, no, uh, you know, thank you. Um, and thank you for, for, the, um, for your, your, your comments. And it's, I always find this um, really inspirational. Um, and um, uh, Bishop Tyson's um, comments this year are not only inspirational, but they take a different tact. Uh, it seems like every year, and I um, and I really I really enjoy them. What I what I just briefly want to say is I'd like us to work next year toward having, of course, hopefully an in-person event, and um, I'm hopeful that we can gather the names of more Catholic lawyers and get the word out um, and have not only uh, uh, you know, our red mass, but I'd like to see us maybe have a dinner afterwards so we could really, rather than just get together for you know, 10, 15 minutes with a quick hors d'oeuvre that maybe we could you know, sit down and have dinner and have a chance to talk a little bit about the message that we hear and, and get to know some of our um, fellow lawyers uh, a little bit better. Um, I have a feeling that there are many Catholic lawyers out there that I don't even know our Catholic lawyers um, because I just, you know, I don't go to church with them. I don't, uh, I only go to, I go to St. Paul 
<clears throat> and once in a while up to St. John the Baptist in Cleelum. And uh, I, I don't know that many Catholic lawyers. There aren't that many that I see at 11 a.m. Mass on, uh, on Sunday at St. Paul. So I would just like to, like to expand our circle, bring more people in and get to know um, our group better so that we can be of support to each other, um, be of inspiration, be inspired um, by the bishop's words um, and, um, and, and take them into our everyday practice. Yeah, thanks for that, Terry. And I mean, I'd be open to even having more than one red mask, Chris, if we did something in Tri-Cities. I think it's a matter of finding people. Uh, Maria and our team here are happy to maintain a database. We just don't know, you know, I mean, we have an annual Catholic appeal database, but we don't know much about the parishioners. Um, you know, we're really dependent on the local parish to do that. Um, Chris or Val or I just saw Deacon Fred. I mean, Val, I know you're up there in in uh, um, uh, Kittitas County, and I don't. You probably come in contact with a lot of lawyers uh, if you're at the courthouse there. Um, don't know how many Catholic lawyers you know or. What you, if you've got any thoughts on this in terms of Kittitas County, other than, of course, you would know Terry, because Terry's got an office that there in Ellensburg. Um, so Val, thanks for joining us. And if you want to make any comment, feel free to jump in. Well, it's my pleasure. So actually, I can look out my window and probably look over Terry's um, area in the Tiana Way and seeing the clouds um, just barely have a little haze over Mount Stewart right now as it's getting oh, dark. Oh, we're just, I wish your camera worked because yeah. <laughs> you could point it that way. Just a little bit of a hazy cloud around Mount Stewart. Other than that, it's a beautiful sky. I, I, will I will work a little more diligently. Um, I know of one Catholic attorney in Kittitas County Courthouse and I feel like we have an excellent relationship and part of that relationship is as strong as it is because I know that we share a faith connection and that can make the day-to-day -day, um, stress of unpleasantries that occur in the superior court legal system particularly so much better just knowing that there was someone else who shared my faith. So I will reach out to her more directly and see if I can encourage her to um, participate in uh, any future activities. If she can spare the time with her busy schedule with the law and three young children and her family, <laughs> but I will reach out. Oh, Val, you're the best. Thank you. And let Maria particularly and myself know because uh, we just, we're trying to build a database. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking back Terry, I wish we would have actually had sign-in sheets if for those masses. We just never did that. You know, we just plucked an atom paper and people came. So Chris, I'm, I'm wondering if you've got any thoughts on this as well. I, I feel like I, you know, I don't mean to be calling people out like this, but Chris, what do you, any thoughts or reflections? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that uh, I really appreciate this. Uh, this is the first time I've participated I probably should have participated uh, more in the past. Uh, not that I in, don't enjoy the drive to Yakima, you know, for the finance council meetings and things, but uh, uh, Ron, Ron St. Hilaire uh, expressed uh, that he, oh, yeah. he, Ron was sorry he couldn't make it, but his uh, oldest boy, Patty, turned uh, 18 today. And so they were doing a uh, they were doing a birthday party for him, but he wanted to express uh, that he missed uh, the opportunity to be here. We'll try to try to work at it next year. Um, I tried to run down Mario Ledesma, um, but uh, <laughs> my computers <laughs> I lost some computers, and so I lost his email, so uh, I wasn't able to get it out to him. Uh, I know that uh, I've got a couple of other lawyers that are in. Uh, St. Joseph's in, in Kennewick. And I can't, I, I got to believe that there are some at Christ the King uh, in Richland. So um, it's, you know, it is, it's a, it's, it's outreach that we've got to make. I think, you know, I think it is a good thing that uh, we do understand that we are, uh, we have a profession, but we have a faith uh, that really underlies who we are. And I think it's very important. I, I enjoyed the words you had tonight. Yeah, thanks. And I'm, 
happy to do something down the Tri Cities. And uh, of course, you've been a gracious host to us a lot. But we also we've got the convent together. We're actually going to do the first barbecue. I'm going down there. Uh, my COVID world is I have a you know room now in Kennewick, and I'm down there at least uh, one weekend. Well, one once a month. I'm going to lean over to Holy Spirit and um, Christ the King this weekend. I was at a couple of masses. I'm going to actually be at St. Joe's Friday night for the English and Spanish mass for Feast of St. Joseph. But we could even host something there at the convent. I mean, there's a plaza there. We're getting a barbecue. So let me know and, you know, I'd be happy to do that. And uh, in fact, we could do something up in Ellensburg as well. I mean, I think, you know, I just want to get flexible about this. So you know, even if we have a red mass at the cathedral, at least we have something across the diocese or we do more than one mass. So yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Deacon Fred Alfredo is from Christ the King, actually. I don't know if he knows any lawyers and it don't know if he's still there in the screen, but he's been faithful at coming at all of these. Uh, so thank you, Deacon Alfredo, for being here. Um, I mean, again, the basic question, this would be the final uh, and I'll send this out to you, the final PowerPoint. How can we assist you in your journey of faith? That would be kind of the bottom line question. We'd like to be able to do that. So I think we're at an end. <laughs> so I want to thank you for taking time for being here. And um, uh, just wanted to give a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of an hour Zoom. Uh, thank you. And, uh, well, and, and I have Bishop, uh, I know that we didn't keep a sign up sheet the last couple of years, but I've got a pretty good memory for who was there. Um, and I'll, I'll start with, with, that, with that list. And then um, I'm going to ask some of those that were there to add to it if they can. Um, and, we can and we can kind of grow it. And then I'll get it over to, um, to Maria and to you. And then maybe yeah. we'll grow it from there. If you receive, you know, maybe Chris could send you the names, um, you know, of, of some of the people he's mentioned tonight and, um, and uh, any contact information. And then um, we'll just, uh, uh, we'll just uh, make it grow. Yeah, and what will happen is Maria, uh, thank you again, Maria. She's gonna be, let's see, did we get everybody's email on here? Uh, Chris, did you already, or maybe I need to scroll up. Chris, did you sign in? Today? Yeah. No. Yeah, maybe Chris, if you could do that, and we I see Val and Terry, why don't you go ahead and sign in too with your email? That way Maria's just gonna copy this email. Sure. And what'll happen is you're gonna get the PowerPoint from tonight. Um, and then you're gonna see Maria's email. Um, copy, she'll copy me as she sends it out. You can just reply all and send whatever names you have in, and Maria can start building the database and we'll just Sure. Wait, inch by, yeah, it is Chris Mertens. And I, I know I've got that email myself. <laughs> Make it easier with me. From Unfortunately, me. no, I'm just. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, so we have, and then Terry, if you just pop your email in there. Yeah. Uh, I will see that. Whatever one you'd like us to clog up. Okay, okay. Anyway, lost you. I think I lost my picture for some reason, but uh, thank you so much. And I guess we'll sign off, but I'll get that in for sure. Okay. Yeah. Can you put it into the chat room or no? Yeah, I'm trying to. It's not taking it for some reason, but I'll, I'm going to. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know why. Um, and let me see if I can actually pull up. Oh, well, Maria, you should have Terry's email from sending him the first draft of the PowerPoint. Yes, I have his okay. and I have Chris. So you're good to go. All yeah. right. I have him. I'm good. All right. Well, I'll just say a little closing prayer and we'll be on our way. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of our legal professionals, uh, for their love of the law and their love of you. And we ask you to strengthen them in tying together love and justice in their daily lives. We ask this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, I've learned that I can't give absolution over Zoom, but I give blessings over Zoom. So okay. there you have it. Okay, great. Right, take great. care.
Deacon Fred, thanks for being with us too. God bless. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Good to see you all.